GTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Three Chinese astronauts blast off on a mission to spend six months on China's orbiting space station and complete its construction. Our other headlines, the UK government announces China will no longer be part of a project to build a new power plant in England. Twitter boss Elon Musk accuses Apple of withdrawing advertising from the social media platform and threatening to remove it from the App Store. And which teams will book their place in the last 16? We'll have the latest from the Qatar World Cup. Within the past hour, three Chinese astronauts have successfully blasted off on a mission to complete the construction of China's orbiting space station. They'll spend a week working alongside the space station's current crew, China's first ever crew rotation in orbit. The astronauts will remain in orbit for the next six months, conducting experiments and spacewalks. Well, Emma Keeling is from CGTN Europe's science and tech show, Razor. Uh, so, Emma, how significant is this launch? hugely significant. I mean, the fact that they've even built a space station is just a massive achievement. But there's lots of little moments. I mean, you've already covered a couple of them there that, you know, we've had the handover from Shenzhou 14 to Shenzhou 15. Uh, and then a couple of days, the old crew, they'll be coming back to Earth. They'll be there for six months. And they're really, it's all the science experience that are going to be happening there. Uh, and I think that's, it's the really interesting thing is, is the international collaboration. So multiple countries. They want to involve developing countries as well. There's something like a thousand experiments that are going to be happening over the next 10 years and, and they want it to be permanently operational and occupied for at least the next 10 years. So lots of exciting things that are going to happen. The whole tech and engineering achievements just involved in this as well. So we're going to find out more and more as we go along. And Tian Kong might be the only uh, station, uh, space station operating uh, in orbit, given NASA says it plans to retire the International Space Station before uh, 2030. Yes, and who knows exactly what date that will be. It seems to be shifting all the time before you know, it's going to be decommissioned. But there's around 20 mini laboratories on Tiangong. And again, if we go back to you know, the international collaboration, all the astronauts coming on, doing all that research, it's going to open up a, a whole new uh, you know, load of, of research in space that we're going to see things like you know, studying microgravity um, when it comes to you know, real tissue, like human tissue. Also, um, you know, how do fires behave in space? Now, hopefully somebody's got the safety uh, <laughs> involved with that one. Um, but you know, some of these things have been done on the IWS as well. But it's just moving that science along. And then also the possibility of having um, space tourists are there. I mean, you're probably going to have to pass a fitness test, so Jamie, that's you and I out. But yet there's so many new things that, that can come out of this. And, you know, we've seen things like, you know, earbuds that have been developed from space programs in the past, memory foam pillows. So who knows what inventions will come from this new research? Emma, thank you very much. Emma Keeling from uh, CGTN's uh, documentary series, Razor. The current crew on board Tiangong are preparing to welcome their first guests as they get ready for their return journey home in a week. The three astronauts have spent six months in orbit on a busy mission constructing China's space station. Our correspondent Sun Ye reports. Uh, the busiest crew. I like this title very much. Shenzhou 14's commander Chen Dong had said so over a live stream from China's space station earlier this month. He's called the crew's journey a dream come true, having witnessed their home in space expand from one to three modules and becoming, in his words, luxurious. Three, two, one, off. And their time on board has been so worth recording, to say the least. The Shenzhou 14 crew set off for the space station in June and helped assemble the two space lab modules that completed the station's basic T-shape. 
That process involved nine assembly formation and multiple missions for docking, separation, evacuation, and transpositioning. They've also conducted three spacewalks, more than any of their predecessors. The crew has also been part of quite a few firsts. The first docking of two 20-ton-plus modules in orbit, the first transposition mission for China Space Station, the Tianzhou-5 cargo ship's world record time in rendezvous and docking in just two hours after launch. And the Taikonauts are getting ready for another milestone moment anticipated by space watchers across the world. When they meet their Shenzhou 15 counterparts for the first ever China Space Station handover. The Taikonauts head coach Huang Weifen has described the Shenzhou 14 crew as exemplary. She says they've been the best in physical and mental forms, have the strongest operational skills and abilities, and they're just simply outstanding. As for the crew themselves, they often like to call the past six months a period of dreams coming true in space and say they wish to share that pride and joy and hope to everyone back on Earth. Sun Ye, CGTN, Beijing. With the launch of the Shenzhou 15 mission, China's Tiangong space station has three main modules alongside three spaceships. CGTN's correspondent Wu Lei has been on a virtual tour of the station, exploring some of its unique characteristics. Coming in, you can see how bright and spacious this place is. It's a large space of 110 cubic meters with so many rooms, so don't get lost. This is the Tianhe core module, the main living space for astronauts. There are three different sleeping areas where you can lie down and sleep. Actually, there are another three sleeping areas in Wen Tian Lab module, which will support up to six technauts on board. There are over 120 kinds of food here, so technauts will have a different menu every day. All right, dinner is over, time for exercise. We have a running machine or a bicycle, the choice is yours. Scientists developed a special recycling system to support life in space. The system can collect moisture, volatilized water, and carbon dioxide released by the tachonauts. Even the urine is processed. All of that is done through subsystems such as electrolytic oxygen production, drinking water collection and treatment, urine treatment, and carbon dioxide and harmful gas removal. Can you imagine? Within just a year, the system has recycled over 2,600 kilograms of water. That's a sufficient amount of water for a person to drink over a span of two years. Now we can't forget our daily necessities, the internet. On China Space Station, Taconauts can now use a mobile app to control the lights. Just like this. And inquire about the storage and supply of the materials. And if you miss your family or friends back on Earth, you can make phone calls, chat through video calls, send and receive emails. You're watching CGTN, still ahead. Elon Musk takes a bite out of Apple. He says they're about to dump Twitter from the App Store. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos and unicorn companies. Make sense of it all with global business only on CGTS. There's a new agenda for a new world, accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work, travel, and connect how we think 
interact and develop. It's a new reality, a new agenda with me, Juliet Mann. Hello, welcome back to Global Business Europe. Quick reminder, CGTN is available to watch free on all of the major digital platforms on Smart TV or online at Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV, YouTube, Daily Motion, CGTN.com and the CGTN app and in the UK on Freeview. Elon Musk has accused Apple of planning to block Twitter from its app store and of scaling down its advertising on the platform. The billionaire CEO says Apple is pressuring the company over its content and moderation practices. Apple has yet to respond, but it has previously removed apps that fail to meet its rules. Well, let's talk to our correspondent, John Terrett, watching events for us in New York. Um, John, can uh, Elon Musk really oh, yes. afford a fight with <laughs> Apple? No, basically, in a word. It's the clash of the tech titans, Jamie and Robin. It's here at last, except we've been here before. 21 months ago, I think Facebook was very upset with Apple. At that time, Facebook was concerned because Apple had changed the way the iPhone works so that you could, if you wanted to, switch off tracking. And Facebook, of course, relies on advertising, and they need to know who's looking at the advertising for how long and when. So Facebook rowed with them and came off very badly. And that's simply because Apple and the Apple Store are just so big and powerful in the world that we live in at the moment. Now, Elon Musk has been tweeting, as I said. We have two of them as an example for you. I'd like to bring the first one up now. This is what he said first of all. He said, Apple has mostly stopped advertising on Twitter. Do they hate free speech in America, he asks. And then later there was a second tweet that came out from Elon Musk, and this one read as such. Apple has threatened to withhold Twitter from its App Store but won't tell us why. Well, that was a rhetorical question because we know jolly well why, don't we? We know why, because Apple is a left-leaning company in the main, and Elon Musk seems to be leaning towards the right in the main, and they have to be very careful because they're under pressure from their own advertisers and supporters. And so it does appear as if Apple has, at least for the time being, started withholding advertising from Twitter, but there's been no official comment from Apple over in Colpertina in California. I think it doesn't help, you know, when Elon Musk tweets photographs like he did yesterday of his bedside table, which the Americans call a nightstand, and that photograph contained an oil painting of George Washington, two guns, four Coca-Cola decaffeinated empty cans, a Buddhist symbol, and a few ring stains on the desk itself where the Coca-Cola cans have clearly been moved. I mean, all of this makes people like Apple very suspicious of where he is in his own mind and where he is with this company that he bought for $44 billion. But there is another thing. Elon Musk is unhappy with the 30% charge. I think it's 30% that Apple takes for every Twitter download from the App Store. And so he's saying, look, you know, if you don't come up with some decent answer for this, I'll start my own store to rival the Apple store, and I'll even start my own cell phone to rival the iPhone. Well, of course, this is how he conducts himself, and we uh, in the media love it because, of course, it's so newsworthy. But those analysts who watch this thing very closely say with everything else going on, and bearing in mind what happened with Facebook, the last thing Elon Musk needs right now is a battle with Apple. John, let's just turn our attention to uh, cryptocurrency, another uh, crypto firm yeah. filing for bankruptcy. What more do we know? Yeah. Well, this is a very important story. We should pay a lot of attention to this, folks. We, this is not going away. Uh, this is a company called BlockFi, which is based just over the Hudson River, very close to the stock exchange, but over in New Jersey. They've filed for voluntary Chapter 11 bankruptcy proceeding, which means a judge will oversee and reorganize the company and hopefully support at least some of the creditors. But of course, it comes after bad news involving.
bankruptcy filings by the company Voyager and Celsius. And last week I told you about concerns about how much money they have in the bank over at Grayscale and Genesis. And this BlockFi Chapter 11 filing is the direct result of FTX and Sam Bankman Freed. And BlockFi is a sort of crypto custody company, I suppose, an ex part exchange, part lender. They tell us they have 100,000 creditors and they owe somewhere between $1 and $10 billion. Now, here's the thing. It's worth bearing this in mind. In June of this year, FTX, which is the big headline company in trouble, lent BlockFi $250 million. We're told just to keep going. And there's some repayment crisis going on between those two companies at the moment, or money is probably at least stuck at FTX. In February of this year, the leading regulator, the SEC, fined BlockFi $100 million for what many people in the cryptocurrency world think was an unnecessary fine, but it's been hanging over their shoulders. Now they've filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Could it be that the leading regulator, which is supposed to support customers and look after customers and, and consumers, actually, in the end, led 100,000 of them straight down the river by imposing that fine, and now the company's filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy? We don't know whether they paid all of it, or any of it in installments. That simply is not known at the moment. But I tell you, this is a story, as I said at the top, that's not going to go away, and we should follow it quite closely, although it is insanely complicated. And that's part of the problem, of course. So many people don't really understand the blockchain. John, good to see you. Thank you for that. Our correspondent, John Terrett, in New York. Uh, well, more uh, turmoil in the world of cryptocurrencies. Uh, United States exchange bit front is to close, citing what it says challenges in a rapidly evolving industry. Uh, bit front, which is backed by the Japanese social media firm Line Corporation, is immediately halting new registrations and deposits and will cease operations in the next few months. It follows, of course, the collapse, as John was saying, of crypto exchange FTX and lender uh, BlockFi. Uh, striking truck drivers in South Korea are defying an unprecedented legal order compelling them to go back to work. Rallies have continued nationwide in a dispute over pay and conditions and the cement industry. Some truckers have shaved their heads in protest. Failure to comply with the government's work start order can result in fines, loss of driving licenses and even prison. EasyJet has reported record quarterly earnings for the summer and says bookings are soaring despite the rising cost of living. Sales took off in July to September, helping the budget carrier shrink its annual losses to $213 million. That's a sharp fall on the previous year. The company is reporting strong demand for Christmas and spring and says it expects business to return to pre-COVID levels by next summer. Saudi Arabia has announced plans for a major new international airport in Riyadh. It comes on the first day of the World Travel and Tourism Council Summit, which is taking place in the Saudi capital. And our correspondent, Luigi Barkel, is there. Uh, so, Nawid, what's caught your attention today? Well, this summit taking place here, Robin, the biggest of its kind, the WTTC, uh, nearly 3,000 participants taking place from more than 140 countries. There are also 250 CEOs, so business is high on the agenda, and 50 ministers as well, so policy front and center of the sorts of conversations that have been happening here as well. As you mentioned, Saudi Arabia very much taking the lead. The location of this uh, is definitely uh, not by chance. Uh, it's announced this uh, new major airport here in the capital, Riyadh, which will essentially swallow up the current airport that's here, King Khalid International, and replace it We're within the next few years, in fact, with a new one called King Salman International Airport. And if you look at the, the figures, quite impressive. Six runways. Uh, it may not sound like much, but Heathrow Airport in London, which for a long time was uh, the busiest in Europe, one of the busiest in the world, only has two runways. It also says the Saudi government that it wants 120 million passengers to be passing through this aviation hub as they expect it to become uh, by 2030. So plenty of ambition, but in reality, achieving that won't be easy. If you look at the region, you have the likes of Dubai, you have the likes of Doha uh, with Hamad International Airport, Istanbul as well. Uh, Turkish Airlines doing quite a, a lot to try and make that country uh, a more established aviation hub. So the, the Saudis do face competition, but I think it harks to a, a wider point here so far uh, in, uh, as this summit has taken place. More than $10 billion of deals have been announced for investments in Saudi Arabia. It's not just uh, about the money. There are wider issues here at stake, as uh, one of the country's senior ministers told me earlier. 
One is the contribution of our sector to our overall GDP to take it to 10% by 2030 from a starting point of 3% back in 2019. The second one is the number of visits to take it to 100 million visits by 2030. This year so far, we're already at 70 million visits, both international and domestic visits, for different travel purposes. The third target, which is critical, is the number of jobs created. We're aiming to create 1 million extra jobs by 2030. And we've put a rigorous plan in place in order to deliver that. But Nawid, we are still seeing some challenges in the aviation sector. Yeah, very much so. The theme here this year, travel for a better future, essentially looking at rebuilding the industry after what's been a bruising few years. Thanks to the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw uh, airlines stand still, airports stand still, as well as uh, staff shortages, which are continuing to be one major challenge for the sector. The COVID-19 pandemic and associated lockdowns, uh, another, the world travel, uh, uh, world tourism organization part of the United Nations estimates that so far in 2022 things have bounced back in general but the way it's happening isn't very much uniform in Europe for example summer arrivals there this year uh, about 90 percent of pre-pandemic levels but here in Asia where 60 percent uh, roughly of the world's population lives the numbers aren't uh, simply that high uh, lots of travelers still seem pretty skeptical uh, the head of the world tourism organization sat down with me earlier uh, and outlined some of the figures in terms of where things stand uh, in international travel. We saw after seven, nine, nine months results from uh, 2022 and we saw that 700 million travelers are back. That means that this is 65, 70 percent of the best years of tourist industry, which was 2018-19 before COVID started. So. We, we saw that everything is becoming a normal life, no masks, no PCRs. Plenty of announcements in terms of investments here in Saudi Arabia, other countries as well, uh, leading hotel companies in the world are here as well. So there is money going into the travel and tourism industry. It employs about one in 10 people around the world. But like so much of uh, what we've seen in recent years, geopolitics is taking its toll as well. The war in Ukraine continuing to have an impact if you look at visas and issues like that. So by no means is it out of the woods, but the message coming out of uh, the WTTC here is that the recovery has well and truly started and it may be a few years before we're back to pre-pandemic levels. Nawid, thank you very much. Our correspondent, Nawid Jabarkil, in Riyadh. Let's talk about cars now because uh, rising energy bills are risking Europe's shift to electric. That's the warning from Volkswagen. VW's boss, Thomas Schaefer, has warned its battery investments will not be profitable if EU policymakers fail to cap rising energy prices. The company is planning six battery factories across Europe by 2030. Besides the energy crisis, European investors also face pressure from the United States Inflation Reduction Act, which officials in Europe complain violates World Trade Organization rules. Well, let's talk to Jim Holder, uh, editorial director for uh, What Car and Auto Car. Jim, welcome back to the program. What exactly is VW going on about here? What's worrying them? Well, the production of batteries and electric vehicles is incredibly energy intense up front, and those batteries in particular take a huge amount of energy to create. Obviously, that energy is then offset as the cars are used, much fewer of them. But what that upfront cost is, is taking uh, account of is higher prices for these vehicles. And what we already see is that electric vehicles are around 20% more expensive than uh, combustion engine ones. If energy prices keep going, that uh, gap is going to grow and they're going to be less attractive to consumers. VW's um, criticism uh, is quite striking. I mean, they're clearly very worried. I mean, might we see a renaissance here of the old technology electric was uh, supposed to banish? Yeah, I think that would be unlikely. I think what VW are trying to do really is put pressure on the politicians to match the sort of incentives that we're seeing, as you highlighted in the US, uh, that their Asian counterparts are getting to invest in this new technology and this vast leap that they're being required to take. They feel they need some incentive to be able to do that uh, and keep prices at a point where consumers can afford these vehicles. If we want to take climate change seriously, they would argue that this investment is required. And I think it's more likely that they're politicking than there will be any back uh, steps to back towards combustion engine technology. It feels like they're far too far down the line for that.
Uh, critics might suggest you can hear the sound of uh, taxpayers' eyeballs rolling across Europe as someone again suggests that the taxpayer, the poor old taxpayer, uh, should shell out here to subsidise those hard-pressed car makers. Yeah, I think it's a, a reasonable criticism and one worth balancing, but I think we have to understand how much of progress uh, has come from mobility over the last 100, 120 years, how it has democratised uh, the growth in financial strength of all of us as individuals. Uh, and if we want to keep what we have today in terms of all those benefits, then someone has to really pay for it and invest in this step change in technology. And I think really that's what they're asking for, someone to give them a helping hand. Uh, they can't make the change alone. And presumably pretty galling for European car bosses to see the kind of support that is taking place in the United States under President Biden. Absolutely. You have to look at uh, the the financial contribution that the car industry makes to local economies around Europe. You know, a huge proportion of exports, a huge proportion of R&D spend, a huge proportion uh, of generating VAT and, and other tax income for these governments. Uh, the car industry is a, a absolute mega beast of uh, the economy around Europe. You know, in America, they're supporting it. In Europe, less so. Uh, and that needs to shift. And I think really that's what BW is looking for, for that support from the financial paymasters within governments to help them make these investments. A battery factory is at least a billion dollars of investment per factory. So they need help to make that shift. Jim, good to see you. Thanks for coming back on the programme. Jim Holder, Editorial Director of What Car and Auto Car. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead, the UK government announces China will no longer be part of a project to build a new nuclear power plant in England. perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing, and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? The difference is in the detail, in the background, Defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN, see the difference. Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our main story, three Chinese astronauts blast off on a mission to spend six months on China's orbiting space station and complete its construction. Well, let's talk now to uh, Christian Feichtinger, the executive director of the International Astronautical Federation. Um, Christian, welcome. First of all, um, what is the significance 
of this mission for China's space program? Well, first of all, congratulations to China's uh, great success with this uh, launch of this crew today. Um, it is very significant because it is it marks the last step of the construction phase of the China Space Station. Um, and it kind of marks also the start of the real operational phase. It will be the first time that there is a direct uh, crew exchange being done. Uh, and that just means that now China is fully ready, ready to operate its space station uh, on a regular basis, permanently crewed. So great achievement and big congratulations. And what is the main function of this station? Well, uh, of course, today, um, countries, they do not produce space infrastructure just for um, uh, prominency reason, but the, the reason behind this is always science. And having an outpost in near-Earth orbit allows to do a whole range of scientific experiments, from physical experiments, technological experiments, life science experiments, and they all produce outcomes and benefits for our life on Earth, but they are also extremely important when we think about the next step of space exploration, going further, going back or forward to the Moon and to Mars at some point in time. You need to have a test bed in low Earth orbit, and a space station like the China Space Station is a perfect test bed for that. What do you think is the hardest part of uh, working on this space station mission? Well, if you look at the mission uh, as a whole, of course, the most exciting moment is most probably always the launch of a crew, uh, which, uh, which is always a very exciting moment. Uh, of course, the duration of a mission has a strong impact on the stress of the astronauts. I mean, being on orbit uh, six months um, in microgravity, you need to keep your body, your organism really fit so doing regular exercise. But the most exciting things, I'm sure astronauts would agree, uh, and at least that's what they have been telling me when I'm talking to astronauts, are extravehicular activities. And as far as I understand, there are also three to four EVAs planned for this Shenzhou 15 crew coming up now, uh, finishing some installations. And this is for sure always the most exciting um, and, and also most probably the most demanding exercise and activities on board. Obviously a huge achievement for China, but how much is this also an international endeavor? Well, you know, space exploration um, today is, um, it, I mean, is a, a, an activity or an achievement of humankind. It is a very expensive um, activity um, the International Space Station is a project uh, that has been undertaken by five uh, international partners that have pulled together, pulled together also uh, the resources and the funding. Now China is coming up as, uh, as well with its own space station. It is important to have more than one outpost in low Earth orbit. And we are hearing now more and more also about private uh, commercial space stations. Uh, that will complement the ISS and the China Space Station. I think it is extremely important because the more platforms we have available, the more astronauts' time we have available, the more experiments and the more science can be done. And there is another aspect, um, the aspect also of redundancy. I mean, uh, we have seen, for instance, in the ISS uh, program, uh, that relying on only one transportation system like the U.S. Space Shuttle or the uh, Russian Soyuz spacecraft uh, would have been uh, extremely dangerous for the ISS because if there is a major problem with one of the carriers, um, um, you still have another one to rely on. And the same is also true if you have more than one space station, because at the end, um, uh, um, the space station, the China space station, is also constructed in a way that theoretically and technically it would somehow be possible to uh, dock also with a non Chinese spacecraft to the space station if this would be uh, necessary in an emergency case, for instance.
It's a very uh, difficult question because I know there are absolutely hundreds of, ex of experiments taking place and many, many spacewalks. But what are you most excited to come out of this mission? What are you watching in particular? Well, of course, the EVAs, they are always kind of uh, very, very specific and very dangerous, demanding, challenging uh, in every aspect and exciting moments. I mean, uh, if you talk to astronauts, stepping into uh, working in a space station is already an exciting thing, but stepping outside um, uh, a space station and having only this very, very thin layer of uh, a spacesuit between you and the vacuum of space, I think this is always a very, very special moment. But of course, um, every experiment that is performed on the space station is important. Scientists have been uh, working over years to prepare these experiments, and they are, of course, eagerly waiting to get the results. And as such, of course, um, every activity that is done on the space station is of huge significance and importance and is therefore also planned very carefully. Christian Feichtinger from the International Astronautical Federation in Paris. Thank you very much indeed for talking to us. Thank you. Well, takeoff and re-entry are the most dangerous parts of any space mission. On the launch pad, astronauts are sitting on top of what's essentially a huge missile, and it's vital to ensure they can escape should something go wrong. CGTN's correspondent Wu Lei has been talking to the team at the Shenzhou 15 mission. The safety of astronauts is the most important aspect of all manned missions. But what if the rocket fails during its flight period? Chinese scientists have developed an escape tower which is installed at the top of the rocket. In case of an emergency, its own engines will kick in and drag the spaceship away from danger. We are now at one of the assembly buildings at Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. This is a real escape tower now standing by for the Long March 2F Y-16 rocket. It's only the main part, but the total length of this escape tower is over 8 meters. Shi Hongbin has been developing the escape tower engine system for over 20 years. He says China started to develop the escape tower back in 1992. After years of research and hundreds of ground tests, Chinese scientists conducted a comprehensive successful test launch of the escape tower and the rocket in 1998. The escape tower starts working at an altitude of 0 to 39 kilometers and between 0 to 120 seconds after the launch. It has a main escape engine, a separate engine, and four engines in a control system. So the entire escape tower has six engines. The current escape tower has been quite stable over the past 20 years, as China is developing its next-generation rockets for manned lunar missions. More advanced escape towers are also on the way. We are now upgrading the escape tower. The new tower will be stronger as the new spaceship is larger. So we will use a variable thrust engine to make the escape system more reliable and safe. China sent its first astronaut Yang Liwei into space in 2003. And since then, Shi Hongbin and his team have been in Jiuquan, helping guarantee the life support system of astronauts during each manned mission. It is a matter of astronauts' life during the mission. It's better if they don't ever need to use our escape tower, but if they do, they will get the service of the highest standard. China's space station will be fully completed by the end of 2022, and will host more astronauts, scientists, and engineers. The escape tower will continuously play a key role in manned space missions and deep space exploration. Wule, CGTN, Jiuquan Satellite Launch Center. Three migrants have reached Spanish waters from West Africa by riding on the rudder housing of an oil tanker. The ship arrived in the Canary Island of La Palma after an 11-day journey from Nigeria. The local hospital said the three suffered dehydration and have received treatment. Greece's Prime Minister says there's progress in talks with Britain to return the Parthenon marbles, or the Elgin marbles, that are also known as, which are now in the British Museum. Speaking during a visit to London, Kyriakos Mitsotakis says while discussions remain private, he senses momentum. 
British officials say the marbles were acquired legally by the British diplomat Lord Elgin, a claim that Greece denies. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak says the golden era of relations with China is over. In his first major foreign policy speech, Sunak has vowed to replace wishful thinking with what he calls robust pragmatism towards Beijing. Now let's be clear, the so-called golden era is over, along with the naive idea that trade would automatically lead to social and political reform. But nor should we rely on simplistic Cold War rhetoric. We recognize China poses a systemic challenge to our values and interests. The Chinese embassy in the UK says it rejects Sunak's remarks. The spokesperson said the remarks are full of ideological prejudice and constitute a malicious distortion and slander against China's policies. It says China is committed to developing friendly relations with other countries. Well, the UK government has also announced that China will no longer be part of a project to build a new nuclear power station. The group had a 20% share in the building of Sizewell C in England, but its stake has now been bought out by the government. Our correspondent, Paul Barbo, is outside the Guildhall in London. Uh, so, Paul, what more can you tell us about the plans for this plant? Yes, hello, Robin. Well, as you said, I'm right outside the Guild Hall here in the heart of the uh, city of London, where Rishi Sunak gave that speech last night, where he said that we simply cannot ignore China's significance in world affairs, in global economic stability to issues like climate change. Well, just a day later, we hear that the British government has reconfirmed that it will be investing $840 million in the Sizewell C nuclear power plant in Suffolk on the east coast of England. It will be taking a 50% stake with the French energy giant EDF. Now, we did know a few weeks ago that this was on the cards when the finance minister, Jeremy Hunt, in his autumn statement said that this would be going ahead. And interesting, it was actually back in September that it was signed off by the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson. It was one of his last acts in office as Prime Minister. And to put this in a bit of historic context, the last time a British government directly invested public money into a nuclear power plant, it was in 1987 at Sizewell B, which is right next to Sizewell C in Suffolk. And it's going to, this Sizewell C is going to take about uh, 10 years to complete a total cost of about $35 uh, billion. Now, China General uh, Nuclear, or CGN, did have a 20% stake in Sizewell C. The British government had sought that investment, but there has now been a U-turn, and the British government has bought out CGN. Uh, they say there are going to be other investors along the line further, and uh, this comes just a week after the British government said that a big Chinese company had to divest itself of a uh, British, the, in fact the biggest British semiconductor manufacturer after a national security probe. Now, um, CGN does still have a stake in the Hinkley Point nuclear power plant in Somerset on the southwest coast of, of England. Uh, they're a junior partner in that with EDF. It's the first new nuclear power plant to be built in the UK for two decades. Robin. So, Paul, what will this new plant mean for energy security in the UK? Well, um, we heard from the British government that once the uh, Sizewell C plant is uh, generating electricity by 2035, it will be producing enough uh, clean energy to power the equivalent of about 6 million homes for more than... 50 years. The government says that nuclear power generation along with renewables like offshore wind are absolutely critical to Britain's uh, nuclear, uh, excuse me, Britain's uh, uh, energy security. Grant Shapps, the energy and business minister, visited Sizewell C's uh, site in Suffolk today and he said that it was imperative that the risks that come with reliance on volatile global energy markets is reduced. He said that global gas prices are at record highs caused by Putin's illegal march on Ukraine. We need more clean, affordable power generated within our borders, British energy for British homes. Uh, Grant Shapps went on to say that this was at the heart of a package of measures, including the creation of a new body called Great British Nuclear, which would essentially be an arm's length agency to run the nuclear power industry. There will also be new powers granted by the Energy Security Bill. 
There was a report yesterday that Grant Shapps and Rishi Sunak are also considering overturning a ban on onshore wind power generation after a group of politicians, including the former Prime Ministers Liz Truss and Boris Johnson, said that they were in favour of repealing it. It essentially allows uh, just one person who's opposed to uh, an onshore wind power uh, project to event essentially veto it. Uh, we hear that the government is considering getting rid of that. Its proponents say that it would be one of the cheapest and most effective ways of Britain achieving its uh, net zero uh, emissions goal by 2050. Robin. Paul, thanks very much. Across London, Paul Barber. NATO has promised more aid to Ukraine as the country grapples with an energy crisis caused by the war with Russia. Foreign ministers from NATO countries have gathered in Bucharest for a two-day meeting. The group plans to increase aid to Kyiv and to help Ukraine repair infrastructure destroyed by Russian shelling. Millions of Ukrainians remain without power as winter begins. Well, let's talk now to our correspondent Pablo Guterres, who's in Bucharest. Um, Pablo, what kind of help is NATO prepared to deliver to Ukraine now? Well, NATO officials have said that Russia over the last 10 months has tried to break and bend the will of the Ukrainian people. Essential infrastructure has been devastated. And as President Volodymyr Zelensky from Ukraine uh, earlier on said, that 40 percent of his nation's power grid has been severely damaged at some point. Up to 80 percent of Kyiv's residents were left without water. So there is a priority on restoring electricity and restoring power. NATO has said that this could come in the form of a robust aid package that would provide generators, cash, and also weapons to fight off drone attacks. So the priority right now is on the humanitarian aid. As of now, 7.8 million Ukrainians have fled the country since February, uh, since the start of the conflict. And there is a growing concern about what a winter without water, electricity and heat could signify for the Ukrainian people. Earlier on, I posed this question to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Let's take a listen. We have seen millions of people being forced to flee uh, Ukraine uh, already. Uh, many of them have uh, crossed the border into uh, Romania, close to three uh, million. And that just demonstrates uh, how timely and important it is that we meet here in Romania, border of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. And of course, we have to be prepared for uh, more refugees uh, crossing uh, into the rest of uh, Europe. This is a war. This is a brutal war. And, and, and there is a deliberate attack on critical services. And any progress on uh, Ukraine, Finland and Sweden's bid to become members of NATO? Well, it's been 14 years since in these very halls NATO paved the way for Ukraine and also Georgia to join in the alliance. And hope remains that this will happen soon. However, right now the number one concern is how to help Ukraine during this winter, survive this winter, and eventually prevail in the conflict. As far as Finland and Sweden, Hungary has already um, indicated that they support their bid. However, we're still waiting for Turkey. It remains uh, as the last holdout. And we understand that the negotiations with Turkey are right now progressing. So hopefully by the end of this conference, we will have some results. Pablo, thank you for that. Our correspondent, Pablo Guterres in Bucharest. You're watching CGTN. Still ahead. The Netherlands are closing in on a place in the last 16. But who will be joining them from Group B? We can try out the wild and crazy idea. Nothing can stop an idea whose time is coming. This idea is coming. I actually feel quite comfortable in isolation. We should all be very basic when we're trying to save the world. Oh, no.
We hope it will happen. We have to live in hope. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. 2021 was an exceptionally dry year. So says the World Meteorological Organization, which has published a report on the state of the world's water supplies and how climate change is driving natural disasters caused by water. The report says that 3.6 billion people currently face a shortage of adequate water for at least one month each year. And that's expected to increase to more than 5 billion people by 2050. Access to water is only one problem. Between 2001 and 2018, 74% of all natural disasters were water-related, and the number of weather-related disasters increased by five times over the past 50 years. Well, Dr. Stefan Ullenbrook is Strategic Program, Program Director of Water, Food and Ecosystems for the International Water Management Institute. Welcome to the program, Stefan. So this is the first report of its kind. What's it been designed to do? Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Well, we, we here at the World Meteorological Organization compiled this report, and it's, it's the first of its kind that, at the global scale, analyzes the state of the water resources. So where are we with the state of the water resources from 2021? Uh, what are the trends when it comes to availability of water, particularly in surface water, but also we look a little bit at groundwater and other patterns? And where, where are the hotspots of changes? And, and we believe this is very important for policy and decision making. These are the main news. And one of the things that emerged from your report is that there are more water-based natural disasters now. How much yeah. has that been put down to climate change? Thank you. A very good question. I, I'm afraid I cannot give you the perfect answer. In general, about uh, three quarters of all natural disasters are related to, to water. So either too much water or too little water. And so, so either floods or droughts. And what we see through the climate change, the, the water cycle dynamics are speeding up. So we see more frequent and more severe flooding. We also see more prolonged and more severe droughts. How much of that really can be attributed directly to climate change is depends very much on each river basin because there are so many other changes, you know, human development, land use changes, deforestation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's difficult to, to kind of give you exact percentage of the climate change signal. But there's no doubt that we see because of climate change a change in the frequency and uh, severity of floods and droughts. And as you say, not only too world. much water, uh, too little, also an issue. What yeah. about access? to adequate water, that's also a problem, isn't it, for many people? It is, and, and the numbers, un unfortunately, are increasing for the people that, that cannot access water. The one, one obstacle there is they're having the right knowledge and technology to access the water. For instance, while we're in some regions of the world, we see an overuse of groundwater, South Asia, for instance, some of the um, uh, other Asian countries where, where we have very rapid groundwater decline. We have in many parts of Africa groundwater still as a resource that we can further develop. But it needs the right capacity, human capacity as well as infrastructure capacity to access the, the groundwater in a sustainable way. And, and that's, that's lacking. So things obviously need to change then uh, if your report is to be uh, acted upon. Um, who needs to act on it? What yeah. needs to be done? Mm. I guess all of us. You know, at the one end, we need a new approach to water management. The way we manage water resources at the moment is too often unsustainable in many parts of the world. We, we, we erode the resource base in a, in a very unsustainable way. So we need to understand that better. Therefore, better monitoring, better observations are necessary. So more investments in observing the problem and, and studying it and develop solutions that work locally. Um, more sharing of data, often observations are done, but they're not shared with all the neighboring countries in, in one river basin. Even if they share the water resources, they don't necessarily share all the information about it, which prevents integrated approach. But it's also all of us. We all need to change. And we can save a lot of water while conserving water at, at the household, but also by, by in the supermarket. You know, a lot of water you can save through buying uh, products that are seasonal, that are maybe not traveled a long time, that are not irrigated or 
uh, at least with, uh, from an uh, area where sustainable irrigation is possible. So a lot of water can be saved to, to more appropriate consumption patterns. Dr. Stefan Ullenbrook, good to talk to you. That's Dr. Stefan Ullenbrook from the International Water Management Institute. Thank you. Thank you. The world's largest active volcano has erupted for the first time in nearly 40 years. Mauna Loa in Hawaii sent lava shooting into the night sky. Around 200,000 people have been warned to get ready to leave their homes. The authorities have opened two shelters, although the United States Geological Service says lava flows are currently being contained within the summit. The crucial final games in Group A are almost over, with Group B to be decided later. The Netherlands lead Qatar 2-0, Cody Gakpo scoring in the first half, and Senegal lead Ecuador 2-1. Senegal opened the scoring with a penalty. Well, let's talk now to uh, our correspondent, uh, Dan Williams, uh, watching events for us in Doha. Dan, uh, what do these results mean for Group A? Yeah, this is always a nail-biting moment, isn't it? The final two group games being played uh, simultaneously. Uh, people working out the different permutations uh, for this one. Uh, let's start, of course, with that Qatar, the hosts up against Netherlands. Uh, this one's fairly straightforward. Netherlands only needed a draw uh, to go through, uh, and they're cruising through 2-0 in that game. So that one uh, pretty much done and dusted. Uh, Qatar are going to end this World Cup, it seems, without a point. Um, but it's the other one that's really uh, causing a, a huge amount of interest. This one uh, sees Ecuador up against uh, Senegal. Now, Ecuador only need a draw. Uh, they are trailing this game 2-1 currently. Um, but if they score a late goal uh, in the last few minutes, well, they, they will go through at Senegal's expense. Ismail Sarr scored a penalty in the first half for Senegal. Uh, but then back came uh, Ecuador in the second half, uh, equalizing before uh, 150 seconds later, Senegal getting what could be the winner. Uh, but of course, not over yet. It will be very tense times indeed for both sets of fans there. And then in the uh, late games, it's obviously the world's best football team, Wales uh, versus England, uh, whoever they are, uh, and Iran versus the United States. Uh, still everything to play for in Group B. Yeah, very much all to play for, and we're, we'll get to Wales in a second, but as far as the USA-Iran game is concerned, this game has been dominated by ill feeling and tension between the two sides. Uh, it really took up another level. Of course, we know about the political tensions, uh, but on a sporting front as well, it went up a level over the weekend when uh, the U.S. Uh, soccer uh, decided on their social media to take off the, uh, the uh, Iranian Islamic Republic emblem. Uh, and then uh, they say in, in, uh, uh, for the protesters that are uh, uh, taking place in uh, Iran right now uh, to show solidarity. Well, that led to Iran uh, calling for the USA to be kicked out of the tournament. We heard uh, Greg Ballhalter, the uh, USA coach, apologizing uh, for that, uh, saying that they had no idea, he and the players had no idea that this was uh, taking place. So it's really starting to spiral out of, the, out of control going into this game. What it actually means, though, on the pitch is that uh, essentially if USA have to win, otherwise they are out. Uh, Iran, if they win, they go through for the first time ever to the uh, knockout rounds, and a draw may well be good enough. So uh, plenty uh, of interest going into that game. Now, the other game in Group B, as you say, England up against Wales. Well, England, they look uh, pretty assured of a, a place in the final 16. Uh, they uh, just have to avoid a 4-0 reverse, uh, and they will be through. Uh, but for Wales, well, they could go through if they get the win and uh, other results go their way in the other game, if there's a draw in that other game between Iran and, uh, and USA. So uh, really all to play for, plenty of interest there, uh, and no doubt uh, a, a lot of drama to come, as we've already had in these earlier games. Dan, enjoy the football. Good to talk to you. Uh, our correspondent, Dan Williams, in Doha. China's tea making has just received top level recognition, making it to the UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage List. The status relates to the knowledge, skills, and practices of management of tea plantations, picking of tea leaves, and the processing, drinking, and sharing of tea. There are more than 2,000 varieties of tea in China. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thanks for watching. See you again tomorrow, same time, same place, from all of the team in London. It's goodbye. Goodbye.